Hello and thank you for joining us today for Frost and Sullivan's latest webinar. Today's event is titled New Growth Opportunities and Innovation Driving the Global Trucking Industry. My name is Anna and I oversee Frost and Sullivan's Growth, Innovation and Leadership Briefings. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few quick notes. We will have some detailed slides on this presentation. So there's a full screen feature available at the right hand corner of your screen. You can safely share this briefing at any time via social media, email, or blogs. Um, don't forget to submit your questions throughout the session today. And uh, the, today's discussion will also be available on demand shortly after we've finished. Our presenters today are Barney. L, Program Manager for On Highway Commercial Vehicle here at Frost & Sullivan. He has more than 11 years of automotive industry expertise, research experience in the global commercial vehicle market on areas such as research and evaluation of growth opportunities for clients in the commercial vehicle industry. Also from Frost & Sullivan is Jean-Dominique Bonin, Principal Consultant, Commercial Vehicle. Uh, he has 20 years of corporate operations and consulting experience in the commercial vehicles industry in a global context, North America, Europe, and Asia. And also joining us is guest speaker Ian Gardner, President of Change Incorporated. As President, uh, Ian builds on a 20-year career in energy, sustainability, innovation, and finance focused on evolving renewable solutions and business model innovation. With that, I would now like to hand the presentation over to Jean-Dominique. Well, thank you very much, Anna, and uh, again, welcome everyone to this webinar. What we'll start is describing the market environment that is supportive of uh, electrification and autonomous trucking. First looking at the economic driver for that, right now the economy is very good uh, globally. It's progressing at a pace of 4% GDP growth, which is actually better than last year. As it has happened in the last two decades, this growth is driven essentially from Asia. We see that India is very strong with more than 7% uh, increase, followed by China. China has slowed the pace, but it's still very high, and uh, in North America, U.S. is leading also the growth. On other countries, we have less growth in Europe, which is a little bit receding compared to last year. And uh, uh, Latin America is picking up from a very difficult situation in the former year. So the message is that globally, the economy is doing well, and will still be doing well for another two years, which is supportive of the development and investment that need to be done in both autonomous trucking and uh, electrification. Now, when we are talking about electrification, where do we start from? Here, everything that is blue is diesel. So we see that in the medium duty and heavy duty truck market, 94% as of this year of uh, uh, fuel or on the power train is from diesel. The contender if any, is gasoline, but it's something that is linked to the specifics of the U.S. market in the low end of uh, medium duty. So what is interesting is to look at electric and uh, natural gas. Altogether, they are making 3.5% of the market, and we see that we start having a shift. <coughs> 2017, which is a reference, was an exceptional year in China in the way that we had new standards and some bans on diesel which had pushed very much the natural gas in 2017, but already this year, 2018, we see that natural gas is coming back to a more usual or traditional level of 5.5% in, in uh, China. We will see some growth in North America and in Europe, and we see, for example, Volvo is introducing a HPDI engine for natural gas, and uh, Cummins also has a near-zero version, so natural gas is still there, whether for a question of economy, a reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, conditional to making sure that there is not, not too many leaks in, in the uh, supply chain, and also for reduced NOx. Uh, but we see that electric now, driven by China, is at 0.7% of that market, 
and it used to be at 0.4 percent last year. So the growth is there. Uh, it's there to some extent, and it will come back to some extent to natural gas. But really, we see that the ratio in alternative uh, drive lines, which was in 2017 90 percent natural gas and 10 percent electric, is already this year at 80 percent natural gas and 20 percent electric, meaning that electricity is here and it will develop at a fast pace. So, talking about development, what is the outlook for the market? We are looking at the GDP at 4%, right now maybe at 3, 3.5 in the coming years. It translates to a growth of almost 2% in trucks. What is the differential coming from? It's coming from improved productivity in the way that now with the telematics, also with uh, digitalization, with the improvement in the supply chain, and also in the fact that the trucks are evolving to a more premium uh, sector in which they last longer, we see that even if the need for transportation are increasing, that growth in the number of trucks itself is about 1.7 percent. And again, we see that it's important to focus on countries like China, not because of its growth, but because its magnitude, India because of the growth, North America and Europe. With that said, it's interesting also to see in the next slide where that electrification and uh, autonomous driving will happen. These are expensive features as of today, and therefore they will develop essentially in the premium segment. What is interesting to see is that uh, whereas in developing countries <coughs> the initial cost of purchase of a truck is a parameter, now more and more of these economies also are getting more competitive and we see a slow but progressive transition from low initial cost to lower cost of ownership, which drives the difference between the different segments. We have three different segments in the truck classification, low cost, value cost, and premium, and we see that progressively the people are upgrading from low cost to value and some of the value to premium. It means that low cost, which used to be 41 percent last year, would be less than 30 percent uh, in 2025, and more importantly that there is healthy growth in the value and to some extent to the premium segment which should accommodate the need for autonomous tracking and uh, electrification. So with this global trend setup, I will pass the mic to Barani. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, this is Barani Lakshminarasimhan from uh, the Commercial Legal Reasons. Uh, as we, uh, as Jerry quickly uh, briefed about the global opportunities with respect to uh, the market environment, uh, here uh, I would like to discuss in, de in detail about the emerging opportunities in, in the trucking industry as such. Uh, here in slide number 10, like uh, we have captured the top transformation shifts shaping the future of commercial tr trucking. And, and we have broadly classified these eight trends in four categories, and it, ranging from technological, demographic, social, environmental, and, and geopolitical. Uh, with the, uh, these trends, uh, a common theme across uh, these uh, transformation shifts is, is the advent of digitization and, and, the, uh, and the enabling technologies which bring about the change across the trucking ecosystem, not just on the product side, but also in the in, in the and in the uh, fleet and logistics transportation side. And we see uh, this trend becoming an increasing increasing enabler for, for the migration of this industry into a more, uh, in, uh, into a more towards uh, efficiency improvement as well as into a more of a services and solutions based. Uh, Uh, in the news lately, like uh, as we talk in the last couple, last week alone, uh, we have had like three important announcements from this uh, in, in the CV industries, which translates into uh, these uh, transformation shifts. Uh, example, like uh, Baidu self-driving buses center mass production in China, uh, and and, and we have seen we saw uh, uh, electric freight liners being booked uh, being advanced booked by. Uh, Penske and NFI, NFI the, uh, one of the largest uh, transport operators in the U.S. market, uh, and and also we see uh, uh, a tier one supplier uh, instead of unveiling its latest roadmap towards electric and automated trucks and more. Uh, in a nutshell, what we're trying to say is that this is more of a global phenomenon, ranging from developing markets to developed markets, both 
uh, uh, both uh, as well as uh, uh, it's more of not just uh, OEM specific trend, but also a lot of uh, unconventional companies, like there is unconventional uh, companies in the CV industry, that is some somebody like Bayro is investing itself in, in, in self-driving, as well as a tier one supplier like ZF, uh, was predominantly in component system manufacturing is, like, is, is, is showing excessive capabilities, electric and autonomous uh, opportunities. And, 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 and that's the interesting trend here. Uh, this is across the globe as well as across different stakeholders. And that's, that's something very important to be uh, looked into. Uh, moving forward, let us have a quick overview of the autonomous trucking uh, ecosystem and, and what are the opportunities and, and trends is influencing this. Uh, in this slide, uh, here we are trying to factor in what are the, what is, what are the uh, technological uh, attributes of the progress in the auto autonomous trucking ecosystem. Uh, uh, to starting from uh, alert-based or passive systems like blind spot reduction to uh, a lane departure warning and forward collision warning, more of a warning-based system. As we add complementing uh, active safety technology system on the uh, base safety ecosystem, we move from uh, passive safety technologies to active safety technologies to semi-autonomous uh, technologies, highly automated and fully autonomous. These four, these five verticals represent the different levels of autonomous uh, capabilities in the trucking ecosystem, right from L1 to L2, L3, L4, and L5. And, and, and L4 and L5, especially highly automated and high fully autonomous, are, are the levels at which the, the, the industry is likely to move towards probably by end of next decade or early, uh, early 2030s. And this is the time frame at which the technology capabilities are likely to be, uh, likely to be, uh, uh, likely to be uh, followed. At the same time, uh, market acceptance and, and, and business model capabilities evolve where these, these technologies become more of a, a mainstream uh, application rather than uh, more of testing and, and, and CSR related uh, uh, initiatives by large fleets alone. Uh, here we have tried to focus on what are the recent developments with respect to the ecosystem in the autonomous trucking space. Uh, we have we have a recent a recent companies, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the, the OEs, uh, for example, like, like Daimler, Volvo, uh, Volvo, and Packard have, have exhibited level three and level four capabilities uh, with respect to autonomous uh, and, and and also with respect to platooning. Apart from um, traditional truck manufacturers, we see a, a lot of uh, uh, tech companies, especially from um, from Silicon Valley, from 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 across uh, Europe and as well as China, uh, exhibit uh, different levels of uh, autonomous capabilities with respect to oh, the respect to more of an aftermarket after fitment kind of uh, example. Like Peloton is exhibiting Peloton platooning uh, at, at, at at a large level. At the same time. Or uh, Embark is exhibiting uh, a level three capability as well as uh, Too Simple, and also uh, Uber's Auto Division is also working extensively on bringing up uh, trucking at, uh, autonomous trucking ecosystem. Uh, apart from uh, companies which are work on capability uh, exhibition, we also have specific um, uh, tech companies like our, our, our service providers who work on specific uh, areas of autonomous. For example, like uh, Lightix. Lightix and Smadre working on video safety technologies, and 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 and, and then we see uh, HD mapping uh, uh, ecosystem being developed by TomTom, and here, and we also have uh, uh, traditional uh, semiconductor manufacturers like NXP and Intel uh, exhibiting uh, excessive uh, capabilities in uh, processing power, which are which becomes a real. Uh, requirement for uh, future uh, advanced autonomous trucking, for example, in level four and level five, uh, a large amount of data has to be processed within the truck, and, the, and and this would need advanced level of computing speed, and which would which would largely depend upon the processing capabilities uh, of, of, of 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 chipsets uh, developed here, and uh, and 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 the ecosystem wise, what we understand from the what we understand from the developments is. Is, is, is not just uh, trucking companies which are into it in a large scale, but also we see a lot of uh, service providers and tech companies uh, and, and unconventional companies from uh, from the uh, technology and software point of view working uh, working in, in, in tandem with each other, at the same time working independently in developing uh, IP as well as uh, first move advantage. And this is, this is likely to only become more pronounced as you move forward. Uh, Let's see, like the technology as platooning. What are the benefits of platooning? And from the fleet perspective, like uh, we understand from our analysis that increased fuel economy is one of the critical factors of what what platooning could be positioned from the fleet point of view. 
uh, we understand from our researchers that uh, as, as a, uh, the, the, the leading truck uh, has the potential to save uh, fuel saving of close to about 4.5 percent, and, and the trading truck has the potential of fuel saving is up to 10 percent. That is a combined 15 percent fuel saving uh, potential uh, with. Uh, uh, with the two ducks put together, and and that is substantial in terms of uh, of, of fuel savings, given, given that fuel remains the largest uh, contributing factor, uh, both in both in developing developing markets as contribution to the total cost of operations, and uh, and the other added benefits of reduced congestions and and safety improvement and fleet efficiency as well as improving, increase increased driver productivity, increasing driver productivity here is 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 where. Having trucks per, uh, having drivers for each truck, moving towards having a driver per, for a platoon of trucks, where we kind of save on driver costs. At the same time, we uh, drivers largely uh, operate on a less stress free employment, thereby improving productivity as well as retention, which are again becoming increasing challenges uh, in the develop, developed markets. And finally, we see the platoon as the, as the as step or benchmark towards uh, building blocks of advanced, uh, higher advanced uh, autonomous capabilities. Uh, and, and in a nutshell, like we see platooning as the first level, first stone in which the industry has to move towards full autonomous. And we see a lot of traction happening in this business. What are key challenges here in the Thomas trafficking and driving? First, like regulations. Like, there isn't any. There aren't any clear regulations with respect to safety as well as with respect to the liability issues with the, uh, uh, in the in the in the in the testing space as well as in the commercial space. Uh, and uh, social acceptance has also become a critical challenge. And how to take these products to the market when when there could be a social point of view where a lot of drivers could be out of jobs. And this becomes increasingly uh, critical where we see a lot of. Uh, 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 Populous governments coming across developing de developed markets as well as developing markets, and how how the industry uh, as such is trying to package as a solution to not being uh, a politically uh, a touchy point with respect to taking these products to the market. And again, the cost perspective: what are the how the advantages, how the add-on cost is likely to be scattered across? Uh, is there an opportunity here for our, our stakeholders to manage the cost? And again, there is a problem with data sense or cyber security. Since these trucks are smart and connected always to the internet, as other, other, other ecosystem, and they are always likely to be uh, theft of data or theft of uh, other valuable information within the truck. And that is something which is still not clear. And the other one is the transition phase. That is compatibility with conventional vehicles. Since there is no, we not we do not envision a scenario where autonomous trucks. Uh, like it's it's not like going to happen overnight or a couple of years. The transition from uh, initiation of autonomous to to complete autonomous is going to be happening in the span of 10 to 15 years. During that span, uh, the, the trucks with capability or uh, automotive vehicles with capability of autonomous will likely have to partner uh, will have to play on roads which also has conventional vehicles. How this kind of uh, uh, this is, situation is likely to play out, or what are the regulatory point of view, what are the liability challenges? This is something that needs to be discussed and and and, and put on paper, and 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 uh, an industry as such needs to be at a common page, uh, on the same page with respect to tackling these challenges as moving forward. Uh, um, and finally, like we we'll see, like what could be, the, what are the potential success factors, success factors for autonomous trucking to become a, a mainstream uh, uh, auto, uh, 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 a commercial vehicle industry opportunity? First is fleet acceptance. Like, what is it, how how is that these trucks are likely to be hitting the road? Is it is it uh, it's it's not just uh, respect to um, a large private fleets or large uh, a large uh, forest fleets uh, having a small percentage of the trucks into um, converting a small percentage of trucks into autonomous that that kind of adoption is not going to have a large impact in the overall market space the, the uh, what we see is that the, the, the positioning of the technology is critical for the messaging here like that is marketing campaigns uh, need to be built around this as a technology which is enabling uh, which is centered around enabling the uh, enabling the, the truck of uh, 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 the drivers Life that is the kind of like it's going to be an enabling technology which will make the driver's life easier rather than a technology which is going to take the driver of the truck. This messaging is very important and 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 this should be packaged in a way that fleets as well as fleet managers as well as drivers and the and this uh, and the legis, uh, and the legal framework or the uh, policy makers are on the same page in accepting this as a, an efficiency improvement improvement technology rather than a technology which is very likely to. Uh, take jobs out of people's hand. That is very important. Second point is what are the value chain partnership and consolidation? Say, since these 
since uh, there are multiple disparate technology stakeholders involved in autonomous, uh, uh, it is very unlikely that as, as, as one, or one OEM or one uh, uh, supplier or one tech company is likely to be have the uh, likely to have the resources or the technical know-how to to package this into one product. So the partnerships and consolidation is is, is still the way forward, and, the, and and getting the right kind of partnership with the right kind of uh, participant is is, is 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 essential to get the uh, product strategy right. And, and third, and third most important part in our point of view is the business and revenue models opportunity. Like, what is going to be the right kind of uh, business strategy? Like, like we have the product, we are taking to the product of the customer. What is uh, the product should be in a way that creates value for its uh, fleet. At the same time, it should create values for those different stakeholders involved in this technology. Uh, the, uh, this, this different equations in mind. What is, going, what is going to be the business model like revenue? Like, is it going to be a subscription-based business model, monthly or annual subscription on a per night basis, or it could also be a performance-based model that is uh, 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 pay based on value creation for fleets and transport companies, that is like uh, a transport or a private fleet or, or, or a logistics company partners with a service provider or an autonomous capability enabler. And, 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 and the revenue model is based on uh, deliveries or based on the value, value or, or value saved for the potential uh, uh, by these uh, companies, and and this could be a, an idea moving forward, and 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 also revenue sharing stakeholders with various uh, revenue sharing models with various stakeholders also the idea moving. So so it's 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 so this is the most paramount thing that we understand. Like this. get the product on the market with the right kind of fleet messaging, and create the right kind of uh, strategies for technology partnership and the business model. Um, uh, roadmap is, is these three uh, pillars are, are are important for a for success uh, critical success factors for the automotive for, for the autonomous trucking uh, to become mainstream as such. Uh, moving forward, uh, we'll quickly move into the electrification of commercial trucks. Uh, as we discussed uh, about the autonomous trucking, as as a business as a case, we we we'll quickly look through the electrification of commercial trucks. We see what are the trends influencing the market, what are the different business opportunities, and, and how is the market evolving <coughs> for the next 10 to 15 years. <coughs> In this slide, we've seen uh, uh, the uh, the recent developments of electric trucking ecosystem developments for ecosystem developments. Uh, uh, here we have captured uh, the announcements of. Uh, Products, product launches in future. At the same time, we also try to bring in any few uh, launches in the recent past. Uh, example, like we, uh, uh, we we saw Daimler and Volvo showcase their different <coughs> different uh, electric truck capabilities, and also we have uh, non-traditional companies like Nikola coming out with their uh, coming out with uh, their own product, and Tesla is recent to showcasing of capabilities. And November 2017 was a game changer with respect to. Uh, long hair, long uh, long haul highway hauling for this for the global semi industry. At the same time, we had a ECAN refusal launch in September of 2017, where uh, the trucks were uh, uh, sold initially uh, for Europe and North America, and where it's more of a subscription-based, rental-based model. And we see uh, VOID and Kenworth showcasing different kinds of capabilities within the uh, electric ecosystem. Uh, our our messaging here is very clear. Like in the last two years. We have seen a lot of whole host of activities with respect to uh, capability exhibition or testing, and 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 this is likely to continue for the next couple of years. And uh, and, and and beginning from 2020, we we'll, we we'll expect a lot of uh, commercial product launches from a lot of these OEMs mentioned here. At the same time, we also see a, a several new and common players coming into the ecosystem, and this market is 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 likely to heat up. The next couple of years, and by uh, 2025 and 2030, a large percentage of uh, uh, applications, uh, for example, certain applications at least, we, we can we could see a scenario where a majority of uh, uh, the operating uh, operating vehicles could be electric, uh, especially for uh, from city urban delivery, uh, short routes. As for certain applications, uh, offer the better, uh, our higher opportunity for TCO as well as like uptake, and and we see a lot of activity happening uh, in those uh, specific applications. Let's see what are the top trend, uh, top trends driving the electrification ecosystem. Like first, uh, the regulatory point of view is very important. CO2 regulations, climate change, and, and and environmental regulations are becoming increasingly important. And transport and transportation is one of the largest contributors of uh, GHG gases, uh, not just in devel developed countries but also in the developing world. And uh, we see uh, increasing trend, uh, especially in North America, Europe, and China, where the, the, the regulations are skewed towards uh, GHG regulations and GHG mandates. 
and fuel efficiency mandates for commercial vehicles. Uh, and uh, in North America, especially the, the, the regulations are moving from phase one to phase, phase two by early next year, uh, next decade. And we also uh, likely to have a stronger implementation of uh, GHG based regulations in China as well. And, and Europe currently does not have a, a, a consolidated GHG regulations as such, but it is likely to prepare uh, uh, get itself on board with respect to GHG mandates uh, for uh, uh, heavy duty, uh, medium heavy trucks in, 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 in the European market. And, and the next and critical uh, regulation, which is like which is likely to influence large way, is the ultra low NOx conditions. And um, and we understand like ultra low NOx conditions basically, it it, it, it puts an end to NOx NOx, ex, uh, NOx emissions uh, in from diesel vehicles. And uh, with the given diesel technology, uh, the cost of uh, the after treatment system to achieve ultra low NOx is is, is expensive. Uh, and it needs to move into new ways of uh, ultra uh, NOx reduction, moving from SCR to advanced. Uh, Advanced state of like uh, something like uh, solid state ammonia or or something uh, more advanced, which is which is quite expensive. The today's dollar rates is as expensive the engine itself. So the nominal uh, direction in which ultra low NOx regulations will impact is is positively towards full electrics and battery electric vehicles. And ultra low NOx is more of a localized regulation, so it will be targeted more towards uh, city urban city city centers and and, and urban districts across uh, uh, across the developing uh, developed markets. And, 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 and this will likely influence a lot of uh, truck sales uh, with respect to these regions. And, 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 the, and the biggest benefactor will be electric and different forms of electric vehicles. And the other big trend that we see is price drop, battery price drop. From the 2010 to 2017, we saw almost 80% drop in, um, in prices of uh, battery packs uh, with respect to from $1,000, $1,000 kilowatt hour to like, we are somewhere around like $250 per kilowatt hour currently. And this is only likely to go south. As we as we as we discuss, and there are again uh, uh, multiple uh, chemistries which are likely to be uh, developed in the coming years, so that it, it caters to different needs of uh, commercial vehicles. Like, for example, like energy density is a challenge, the power density is a challenge. So, and and, and as we as we talk, we uh, multiple opportunities arise there as well. And as the battery prices drop, the, the TCO and the, the TCO benefits of these trucks become increasingly uh, valuable, and 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 this becomes uh, even more uh, a compounding factor of of of, of propagating uh, uh, driving electrification in commercial vehicles. Uh, let's see. Like, we saw about the trend, uh, critical trends. Let's see, like the challenges, modern day challenges of electrification, like. See the one critical part, like we'd like to know, is like you know, mineral pricing. Like, for example, like uh, for both for batteries as well as uh, uh, motor components, uh, minerals could become a critical uh, critical base for uh, uh, base for developing these components. Since currently the the supply chain is closely knit, and only a very few players have access to uh, these resources and the technology know how to build. There could, we could have we could face short-term challenges with respect to an increase in demand, and there could be a transverse effect on cost of these uh, uh, minerals as well as the batteries subsequently. And that is something that uh, uh, we, we uh, becoming a critical challenge, at least for the short term. But in the long term, where we see like more income, more players come into the market and, and create more innovation as well as uh, uh, the the uh, in, uh, technology you know and the economics of scale come into the equation, this challenge might be. Uh, will will eventually just wait out, and the next is charging infrastructure. Charging infrastructure has there are there are two ways to look into this charging. One is both the network as well as the the technology requirement of charging a commercial vehicle. Unlike a passenger vehicle charging uh, system, like passenger vehicle charging system, like did not have fast charging or DC charging capabilities currently. Like so, it can can be charged overnight at a home with an, as a basic AC charging facility. At the same time, there is a lot of investments uh, uh, from public charging, uh, which caters to the uh, uh, PV ecosystem. Uh, for the uh, commercial vehicle, as such, uh, this system is not existent because of the technology challenges. For uh, example, like DC charging currently could charge uh, could be uh, as expensive as the truck itself, and 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 uh, and and therefore there could be a, a real uh, um, gap in which how these trucks are getting charged. This, uh, commercial vehicles uh, do not have the luxury of getting charged overnight, especially if it is going to certain applications like urban PND, where the truck plies on the on on the daytime and and the night it could be charged at a, at a depot. That could be one possibility. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, when you look at um, uh, different on duty applications, legion halls, or line halls, or long halls, uh, uh, it, it is a must that uh, 
DC charging or, or, or mega charges or supercharges like uh, what like tech, uh, the other tech companies are working on, could, it should be a reality for these these products to become mainstream in in in, in long haul and 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 uh, line haul applications, and ecosystem distortion. That is very important, like because what we see is that even today, like electrification has seen as some kind of a disruptive technology in a lot of uh, a lot of market, not just developing but also in developed markets. Uh, since the season the disruption, there could be a lot of uh, social and economical uh, challenges how this market takes up in. And because there could be political influences of this market uh, not being uh, as successful because there are legacy uh, companies, uh, legacy stakeholders within the oil and gas space or the traditional automotive space who are, who are unwilling or, 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 or are resistant towards uh, going, uh, going aggressive in these, pro these, uh, these uh, technologies. And that could be an interesting short-term challenge that the industry will likely to be facing. And next is go to market like. Since the past cost perspective of these uh, uh, products are, are quite higher right now, like it's, 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 the, 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 the incumbent players need to build a, a, a will find a challenge to get stake get uh, fleets uh, accept these products since these products are new at the same time are, are, are unknown in the operations as well as the question mark about their durability and reliability at the same time what could be the revalue or the or, or re uh, resale value of these trucks. Etc. These are various challenges which will which will be a restrictive point of view when uh, when fleets potentially go in for these trucks, and uh, and this in a broad nutshell, like these are the four challenges uh, uh, that electrification are likely to be uh, in, in 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 commercial vehicles. So finally, let us see like, what are the opportunities. We discussed about the. Uh, 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 challenges. Let's see what are the opportunities right now. So we categorized the opportunities in three pillars. Like one is value chain opportunities from the product development side. Uh, we know we understand from the uh, commercial battery applications there is no one fit battery chemistry which is going to suit all applications. So today there is NMC and, and there is work on LNT, LT NMC and LTO right now. But in future we we can we would be eventually moving into advanced battery systems so, so that uh, the energy density and power density needs are fulfilled for varied applications. For example, like that could be, uh, there are lithium sulfur technologies being worked on, there is then lithium air, and eventually we'll see a lot of solid state batteries. And this is the progression that is happening on the battery uh, battery space. And, and there is enormous opportunity for IP development as well as, as well as for, as well as, uh, as well as for production and, uh, and, and, and distribution opportunities with respect to the product uh, uh, product development capabilities, and the other one is charging infrastructure. As we already discussed earlier, like the challenges for QCV uh, charging is enormous, and so the opportunity as well. And 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 the IP for DC technology is still very uh, very much with very few people. We would can also look into mega charges or superchargers where where the the compared where where uh, uh, electric trucks can be charged at as speed as as fast as how we fill up a diesel and a diesel tanker. And, and these are, are the opportunities as we move forward, like from the ten, uh, five to ten years down the line. This could be interesting uh, decision making or, or, or value enablers for uh, uh, several new stakeholders. And we see, uh, since public infrastructure is, is, is not much of a, a current priority for uh, uh, CVs, since most of their priorities lie in the uh, passive vehicle uh, uh, the investments in CVs largely should be is expected to be driven from um, private enterprises. Either it could be like utility companies or even oil and gas companies coming into the system, but also like uh, IP development, which is technology uh, companies. And finally, like leasing and rent, uh, leasing and rental as, a, as, a, as an optimum go-to-market strategy for OEMs in the short term. Since the cost of these batteries are expensive, packaging that this and, and making these customers believe that these trucks are, are valuable, uh, OEMs and a lot of uh, different stakeholders will eventually go through the leasing and the rental route to get these trucks on the road and get, uh, get the miles on behind the wheels and try to understand the real working conditions and etc. Uh, and this will eventually be throw up opportunities for leasing and rental for incumbent players. And this is a classic case where we saw we see uh, uh, Daimler with its uh, e-canter launch in Europe and North America. Uh, it was more of a rental-based system where the, the, the truck was charged based on a fixed monthly rental of 1,000 euros, which is a 20% premium on what a diesel truck is uh, uh, leased in Europe. Uh, and, and 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 this kind of value, uh, this kind of TCO benefits, if the uh, fleet is, ex is 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 able to exhibit, and 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 this increases the confidence in these fleets, and so that in future, as the battery prices uh, as go go south, we will be able to package these things together. Okay, 
uh, we discussed about uh, the total market environment, and then we had we had a brief discussion about the business opportunities in autonomous and 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 in electric. Let's quickly summarize our our, our today's uh, 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 developments point of view from Frost Sullivan's uh, perspective. Uh, why electric and autonomous? Like that's a good question. Why should we? Why, what is the need for uh, the industry to move towards electric and autonomous? Let's say that. Uh, uh, Let's say we discussed about the digitalization opportunities, digitalization or digitization as, as a technology which is just coming across the EC industry, the application point of view. Uh, with the digitalization, we see any, we, year by year we see improving trucking efficiency, that is like reduction in empty miles, overall efficiency is improved, and capacity utilization of the existing trucks on the road is increasing. And this, since uh, the existing uh, assets Already, it's a commercial vehicle for one of the highest utilized asset classes, irrespective of all the technological development and digitization. But with the help of digitization, these 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 asset classes are likely to be utilized more. And as these things happen, we, this translates into decoupling of new truck sales and GDP growth or economic activity. Since a lot of new truck sales will be uh, will be the free activity. Uh, uh, fleet improvement activity will likely to be factored into improving efficiency. There could be a disconnect between new truck sales. And so what we understand is that like, with the given development in, in the efficiency improvement of the logistics uh, industry, we see, uh, we see an opportunity where uh, we see a, a trend where truck sales are likely to go down for the given, um, for the given uh, fleet activity, not just, not just in develop, developer but also in developing world. Uh, this is from uh, a, a, a logistic industry's point of view. From the disruption, let's see the disruption from the new entrants. Like we see a lot of new entrants coming into the CV industry. For example, like uh, companies, tech companies like Tesla and Peloton, Auto, uh, come from different point of view. Their capabilities are are, are wide, varied, and their their uh, their potential to invest large capital is is is, is bottomless. At the same time, they, their capabilities are, are centered on algorithm building, algorithms, and AI and deep learning. And, and, and these are the kind of uh, uh, players which are, 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 are trying to disturb the market from a point of view. Given these trends are applying, the, the, nominal, the, the, the logical solution for the trucking industry is to evolve itself to cater to uh, a, 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 a future where the business is not just about selling trucks. It's about more about selling a truck which offers a service. And that's where we kind of like build a case where and what are the new emerging opportunities in, in the era of of, of declining uh, truck sales or flattening of truck sales. That's when we identify like there are different trends coming up. Like for example, connected trucks could be an opportunity. Trucking apps, supply chain orchestration, e-retailing, etc. Like last mile connectivity, mobile fleet brokerage, all of the uh, the different uh, uh, service opportunities. And we 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 understood autonomous electrification offers the best platform for uh, uh, incumbent players to 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 create. Uh, to 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 move into this uh, migration, and 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 finally, and finally, like with all the trends that we discussed, uh, we see the truck of the future pointing towards a safe, efficient, and a sustainable service, not just a product, and and autonomous, and and electrification, which eventually will solve modern day challenges about safety, efficiency, and sustainability. Are likely to offer the platform for uh, the incumbent players to move towards a product to a truck as a service solution, and 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 and, and I would I would like to wrap the presentation with this, where we believe the trucking of the future points towards a safe, efficient, and sustainable service. Uh, yes, Anna, like we can uh, move into uh, Ian's presentation. Thanks, Barani. So. We are actually a commercial truck OEM. We are the first company to bring uh, the platform to market that's ground up designed to be all electric, over a billion dollars invested between China and the United States to develop the platform, put the factory online, homologate it through to the U.S. markets and launch here in the U.S. Uh, so we have a, we bring a very boots in the dirt perspective. Um, from operating in the market for the last three years. And what I want to share today is some of the things that we've observed and learned as we've taken the product out to customers and gotten their feedback and seen what's worked and what hasn't. So, uh, Barani had pointed out some of the macro trends. Um, what we're seeing on a, a more granular basis is 
it's four key elements that are really driving this, this adoption of electric technologies, um, particularly in the commercial segment. So we do not play in heavy duty. We're not class eight um, or class two through seven. So this is only solely focused on commercial urban environments. And a big trend driving growth in those markets is simply the macro trend of urbanization. Um, more people are moving to cities. They're ordering more packages online from Amazon and other providers, and those packages need a way to get to the customers, and that's driving the growth of package delivery companies utilizing electric technology, which has a number of benefits. Uh, in Europe in particular, the move towards low emission cities is driving a lot of momentum in the space, as Berlin and Spain and London and Amsterdam and other cities eliminate the uh, the access to the city centers for diesel and ICE engines, then they are companies increasingly are looking for electric solutions, which historically have not been available. So this is really driving a push towards finding new platforms that can move through the city centers that have low cost, low emissions, and the flexibility to to match with the duty cycle. To a lesser degree is the autonomous movement. Um, this is really gaining rapid traction in the Class 8 and the passenger car space. And in the commercial space, because you have a driver entering and exiting the truck on a regular basis to move product, we do see it coming. It will first be tested behind the fence at isolated depots before it moves into an, a, a, an application in the community. But by and large, we think this will be a fast adopter market. Um, we don't see innovating technology in the autonomous space as a key competitive advantage for players here because of the complexity and also because of the demand that we think will be latent compared to some of the other classes. And then the fourth major trend driving it for our customer base at least is their corporate sustainability commitments. As these large global customers have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions over time and making their fleets more friendly and more sustainable, they have not had historically an option of an OEM solution that was serial produced that was able to scale. And so really what they've been looking for is not to be able to buy 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 trucks a year, but to buy 3,000 or 5,000 trucks a year. And the capability that, the unique capability that change brings to the market ahead of the other OEMs is a two to three year head start with that serial production vehicle that the fleets can actually scale with. But the timing is driven almost completely by battery cost. Um, the level of complexity of an electric vehicle is an order of magnitude less than an ICE vehicle when you turn it, take a look at the total parts count. And the bulk of the cost of goods sold is driven by the battery pack. And so if you look at the chart on the right, what we've taken is we've, we've taken actual customer data for total cost of ownership of a diesel vehicle for a typical 10-truck fleet and we've compared it to the cost of a change truck. And you can see there's some overlap in the intervening years in the middle there where the cost of diesel was coming down significantly along with the cost of batteries, but as the environmental regulations start to kick in and the cost of batteries start to decrease even more, you see the delta between the two start to shift. And so this, this 2017, 2018, 2019 time period is really where those lines cross and then start to diverge as, as the battery cost has started to decrease. It's interesting to note that the commercial battery trends are very different from the Class 8 or the passenger car battery trends. In passenger cars, you're optimizing for power density and for range and price. And in Class 8, you're optimizing for range and price. However, in commercial, because the duty cycle is 70 to 90 miles a day and you have such long rails to hang batteries on, you're really optimizing for price and durability and reliability. So you focus on slightly different chemistries and slightly different form factors versus those other markets, and it does enable you to make much more aggressive assumptions on your cost down curve to compete on a total cost of ownership basis. Uh, as I mentioned when we started this out, we're really focused on the last mile. So if you're going over the road, you have a Class 8 truck, uh, Tesla's going to provide that or Peterbilt or one of the other big players. But once you get it into the city center, then you've got to drive it around and actually deliver the people and the packages. And that's really where we're focused. And what we're seeing is that the internet sale package delivery is really starting to drive a lot of volume in this sector. Uh, in particular, Amazon's efforts to build their own fleets, which uh, I expect there will be more announcement of that, announcements around that in the coming uh, months, 
Um, they are going to build their own fleet to compete with the FedExes and the UPSs of the world, and this is really driving a new amount, amount of volume and growth in this segment. So we've seen the industry go through two phases. The first phase, which was sort of the last eight to ten years, was the science experiments phase of the industry where you saw startup companies buying gas platforms, gutting out the ICE engines, replacing it with batteries and, and electric drive chains, and getting them in customers' hands. Um, and what we learned from that is that those vehicles, the electric vehicle platform is really well suited for the delivery duty cycle. Uh, drivers love it. And in an, in an era where driver shortage is an increasing bottleneck to growth for the package delivery companies, having happy drivers makes a big difference. And if you factored in the cost down assumptions on battery manufacturing, you could get to a competitive TCO with significant savings once you got it to scale. I think the best example of this is Fred Smith from FedEx came out publicly with a study that they did that said that they had observed a 20% total cost ownership savings from using an electrified platform. The challenge is, like for any new industry, was the technology growing pains. You were inventing a lot of this technology and implementing it on the fly, um, and there was breakdowns and problems, as you would expect with any new technology. But the bigger challenge was for commercial fleets, their main KPI that they focus on is uptime and reliability. And without a, an established parts and service network, Maintaining and fixing uh, trucks out in the field and accessing the supply chain was a significant challenge that could keep trucks that were grounded for a relatively insignificant issue on the sidelines for months as you tried to work through those problems. The other big challenge was the, the cost and the installation and maintenance of the charging infrastructure. Uh, those costs have come down significantly over the past few years, but, but when you put 100 or 200 or 500 trucks at a depot and you have to charge them all between the hours of 4 p.m. and 3 a.m. or 5 a.m., that puts a significant load on the grid. It puts a significant load on the interconnection, and it can considerably change the economics unless it's managed properly. The, a, a less serious issue was the range anxiety because of the duty cycle fit, but it was an issue on the early vehicle platforms. But the bigger challenge for the large national and international fleets was if I need to flip my whole fleet, which I have committed to my customer base and my shareholders I'm going to do, I need to buy vehicles in the thousands of units and know they're going to be high quality and reliable. And, and heretofore, they have not had the opportunity to do that. Before, we built our, our 4 million square foot state-of-the-art plant in Hangzhou, China, and were able to bring a vehicle to market that's been serial produced that met their quality requirements. So the first vehicle that we brought to the U.S. market is called the V8100. It's a panel van. It's got a 26-foot turning radius. It actually drives like a passenger car, uh, fully electric inboard 10-inch dashboard, and it's completely configurable for whatever upfit requirements the customer may have. And this is, we have optimized the battery pack size for the customer's duty cycle. So if you, you can see on there, it's a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. The range fully loaded is 150 miles. And for a customer duty cycle that's averaging 75 or 80 miles, this gives them 50% re redundancy if they're going to run the air conditioning or they have to run the heater or it's more hilly or there's a lot of stop and start. And what we have found from our early customer trials is that this is a, just about in the sweet spot for, for what they need for their use case. You, we will be able to present more battery, more range, more energy for the same cost over time. But as a market entry point, Based on the feedback that we've seen and how and the analysis of the market, this is a sweet spot for getting things going. This is what we've launched with. And you'll see additional platforms launching next year from us, including a six meter version for the wheelbase. This is an eight meter that'll be far targeted towards Europe. You see a cab chassis, and then you'll see a shuttle product come to market as well, all built on a common architecture but configured for different applications. And mostly for our customers' um, state of mind, we're already in serial production. So we started delivering vans in the third quarter of last year. The factory can do 100,000 units a year annually. Uh, we've contracted for a significant portion of that. And most importantly, it, the factory is filled with German and Japanese state-of-the-art robotics so that when we bring large customers and we have them walk the line, they get a high degree of comfort in the level of quality and repeatability that's going to come, which gives them the confidence to be able to feel like they can begin the process of flipping their whole fleets. Uh, 
Um, the biggest challenge probably of all the ones that have been previously noted is how you're going to charge the vehicles um, because it really requires a solution that's customized to the, to the site where your vehicles are going, the number of vehicles that will be there, what their duty cycle is, the local utility regulations, the state and utility incentives, and the potential for to offer uh, services back to the grid, um, such as frequency regulation, but also what the what the site-specific conditions are for on-site generation or battery storage. And so, to facilitate the deployment of the vehicles, we have created a turnkey package that also provides charging infrastructure, energy management, and behind the meter generation and storage for customers on an as-needed basis. It's sort of a Chinese menu of different options that you pick and choose from based on the specific site configuration. So you've got to figure out how to put the vehicle charging in. You have to determine whether or not you need battery storage and how much, whether or not you need to generate energy behind the meter, either through a fuel cell or through solar or some other means, and then linking all that to the utility and integrating it into their service uh, based on what their specific unique requirements are a high degree of complexity that the customer just wants to have a simple solution for where they write one check every month and have it managed. And so as we view the deployment of, the, of electric vehicles in the commercial space, a significant risk component that has to be thought through, understood, and a solution developed is how you're actually going to charge the vehicles, not just for the next year or six months or 18 months, but the next 10 and 20 years as the fleets completely electrify. Um, on a broader basis, where we see the last mile vision going is you're going to eventually see the adoption of autonomous in this segment. Uh, I think it'll be a, a fast follower. It won't be a leader. Um, you're seeing the decentralization of the grid where you had the traditionally had the utility had these large centralized generating assets that produced power and shipped it out to the grid edge. Now you're seeing that reversed where the grid edge is actually where the generation and storage is taking place and then being wheeled across the distribution systems. And from the customer point of view, they want to have low and predictable fuel costs. Um, they do not want to have to bear the OPEX variability of the change in diesel costs over time. They want to know that they have a steady state. And as you deploy these assets behind the meter, you're able to provide them with much better pricing visibility. And then from a provider perspective, it enables an entirely new asset class and new revenue streams because as the grid continues to decentralize and as we develop a series of generation and storage and management assets that are distributed, linking all those together enables new business model creation focused on the space. And then the last piece from the customer perspective is simply the lower cost of ownership. So even though a lot of these customers have sustainability commitments to their constituencies, at the end of the day, it's driven by cost. And as we walk them through the model and they have their own experiences, um, the long life of the vehicle, the limited wear, the fewer moving parts, and the, and the decreased maintenance costs, typically the maintenance cost for an electric vehicle is somewhere around 30% of what it is for a diesel vehicle. As you add all these up together and balance that against the higher MSRP on the front end, you do get a very attractive lower total cost of ownership over the life of the vehicle. And that's how we're looking at it. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so now at this time, we're going to take a few questions. I know we have um, a few minutes left before we end the session. So I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. And this is actually going to be for uh, Ian. Uh, Ian, at what battery cost per uh, kWh we will, will we see mass market adoption in the urban distribution? I think you'll start to see it um, for high value applications at around $200. Uh, and, and we're seeing pricing that hovers around that today depending on your volumes and then continues to drop pretty predictably on a forward basis. The, the drive towards adoption on cost at this point in the development is less about the cost of the battery, and it's more about the prioritization of marketplaces by the OEMs who are busy defending their passenger car businesses by and large and haven't allocated the capital budgets to develop the commercial platform because the volumes are so much smaller. So I think the batteries are there. It'll only get better, but the real, the real driver will be the OEMs deciding to focus on it as a secondary market. 
Thank you, Ian. Our next question reads, what are the opportunities in emerging markets, EVs and autonomous and trucking? And this is actually for uh, Frost and Sullivan. Uh, Brenny or Jean-Dominique, uh, would you like to take this one? Uh, yes, Anna, like, I'll, I'll go forward first. Uh, with respect to uh, of opportunities in emerging markets, uh, uh, there are specific pockets of growth for either of the technologies. Uh, for example, when you look at China, uh, we are very optimistic about uh, uh, both the autonomous trucking space as well as uh, the electrification space in China because we believe that electrification of commercial vehicles, uh, electrification of CVs, uh, China would be the leader in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the global ecosystem uh, with respect to uh, uh, the EV space. And, and also we see pockets of uh, autonomous opportunities coming up from China. Apart from China, uh, we also see a lot of traction happening in Japan and parts of uh, Asia. Uh, and in a country like, uh, and, and in the other big market uh, in the developing region, uh, for example, like, uh, like some market like India, uh, what we understand from our research is that uh, the scope for autonomous for probably the next uh, 10 to 15 years is, is not uh, is not uh, that much compared with uh, uh, compared with other markets. However, we see a lot of opportunities of electrification in in, in Indian market as well. Like for example, like last mile connectivity, uh, something uh, a product like uh, like uh, uh, Changi, uh, what uh, Ian had discussed uh, has a huge uptake, and and, and we also see a lot of. Uh, uh, incumbent uh, stakeholders in developing markets also working on, on such uh, uh, product strategies. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, it's, this is pretty much what we understand for in terms of opportunities from uh, from uh, the emerging markets. Uh, uh, one more point I would like to add is like, since the ecosystem is largely going to be interconnected, uh, uh, different stakeholders have business capabilities as well as uh, market reach across the world. Uh, and the, the compounding of uh, cost perspective, for example, like uh, battery cost reduction, will not just be a, a developing a developed market trend. It will also have a lot of implications where access to these technologies become more affordable, even for developing markets. Thereby, developing market OEMs can also factor in these technology OEMs when they partner with uh, companies uh, with capabilities of developing these products. So, and we see a holistic development with respect to EVs on a global level. However, an autonomous, case, an autonomous technology, uh, autonomous, we believe, will be largely a developed market uh, 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 trend. Uh, um, a single liberation may be China, where the, the need for autonomous is also like on the higher side. Uh, Yes, Thank you, Bernie. Okay, so we have time for one more question. We have just a, a two minutes left. Uh, this is for Ian. Uh, Ian, how often do you need to change the battery pack in the change van? That's a great question, one that we get asked by the customers quite a bit. Um, the We buy our battery packs from a supplier in Asia, one of the top couple ones in the world that does a lot of volume. And they guarantee our pack for 3,000 cycles, fully, fully charged to fully discharged. So if you figure it's one duty cycle, one day is one, duty, is one cycle on the battery, taking it down to about a 20% residual state of charge, and you figure they drive five or six days a week, then you're looking at a 10, 10 or 11 year battery just on the warranty from from the manufacturer. What what we learned in past testing with NREL and, and other government entities is that the degradation actually is much less than that because the duty cycle for commercial trucks is so soft on the battery pack versus passenger cars or, or over the road trucks. So we're, th we're thinking it's 10 years at a minimum and probably north of 15 uh, depending on how it's driven and what, ge what geography. Thank you, Ian. So um, this concludes today's presentation. I see that we still have some uh, additional questions, and the team will get back uh, offline. Uh, we Once again, we'd like to thank uh, Ian for joining us today, Ian Gardner, uh, President uh, from, from Change Incorporated. And uh, we hope you found today's webinar informative. If there's any additional questions or feedback, feel free to contact Barney. His contact details are provided on your screen at this time. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.